Chapter 22 Connie still had Howie's car and had driven home with it, leaving Jazz stranded. The Jeep abandoned in Jenny's parking lot. G. William drove Jazz there, even though Jenny's apartment building was the very last thing in the world Jazz wanted to see. From the street, you couldn't even tell anything had happened. There were two cruisers parked in the lot, but they had their lights out and engines off. They could have been two cops on patrol, stopping to gossip or swap donut recipes. Down in the alley, he caught an occasional glimpse of a flashlight played along the walls. Crime scene investigating to see if the killer had left any evidence. Footprints, maybe. Maybe he dropped the knife he'd used to... Well, in any event, they'd be looking for evidence. A part of Jazz yearned to join them, but he had told Howie he was done, and he meant it. He was out of the profiling business. It had been abstract and compelling, and, in a way, he had to admit fun when it had been Jane Doe. But Jenny died under his own hands. He had probably pushed her last breath out of her lungs, and how he could have died so easily that. You all right? G. William asked. Jazz hesitated. He was out of the profiling business, true, but a part of him still felt compelled to help, as though the cops could never do this on their own. But who was he to think he could crack this case? Profiling was an art, not a science. Sure, he thought he had some insight into the killer, but way back in 2002, the cops thought they had insight into the Beltway sniper, too. They knew the guy was white, young, childless. So imagine their surprise when they caught John Allen Muhammad. Black, 40s, with a kid close to Jazz's age in tow. Jazz, I asked if... Yep, he said, making a split-second decision. I'm fine. Thanks for the ride. He drove home a little faster than the law would favor. Now they knew how he was all right, he had to shift gears to the other person in his life who needed him. Grandma. He'd left her for a quick check of the in-dash clock. Oh, Lord. More hours than he cared to imagine. He was worried she'd done something stupid. Hurt herself, hurt someone else, done something that would make it easier for Melissa to yank him into foster care. Even if the Benadryl hadn't worn off yet, she would have rolled off the sofa and broken something. The house was quiet and dark when he unlocked the front door. He usually left a light on so that Grandma wouldn't trip in the dark, but he'd forgotten when he and Connie and Howie had left the house a million years ago. He paused in the foyer for a moment, listening to the careful click of the, cl click of the lock as he shut the door. Something cold lingered in the air, something that set him on edge. He had the feeling he was being watched, that someone was in the house. Well, of course someone's in the house. Grandma's in the... He didn't even finish the thought. Absurd, trying to rationalize away the fear. Fear's okay, Billy had said to him once. It had surprised Jazz, who had always heard his father speak of fear as comedic, as something prospects evinced in a desperate, useless attempt to stay alive. Fear was something to laugh at in all its many splendid forms, each one unique to the victim. Fear can keep you alive. The trick is not to let it overwhelm you, not to let it rule you. If you're afraid, that's the universe trying to tell you something. Get away. Don't run. Don't panic. Just pick up and walk out. Calm as you please. Panic makes you stupid. Should he call G. William? After all, he had Howie's cell, an unfamiliar but comforting brick in his pocket. No. No, that was ridiculous. There was no one in the house. He crept into the sitting room. Grandma slept on the sofa, her breath a light snoring buzz. He sneaked closer to her and realized that she was covered with a blanket. She hadn't been under a blanket when he'd left. He turned slowly, his eyes adjusting to the dark, peering into the murk of the room. Empty. She might have covered herself. The blanket was from the chair a couple of feet away. She might have just gotten up, cold, groggily snatched up the blanket and wrapped herself in it before succumbing to sleep again. No one is in the house. It's just your nerves. After everything you've been through tonight, you're entitled. He grinned. Here he was, son of the world's most notorious serial killer, afraid of the dark. What was next? The boogeyman? The monster in the closet? 
gremlins under the bed? Prowling the house like a burglar, he left the lights out, moving silently with touch and memory to guide him. If someone was in the house, he didn't want to let on that he was aware. He wanted to catch the intruder. He checked each room on the ground floor, including the little pantry, just in case. In a moment of paranoia so ridiculous it would have been funny, if not for the circumstances, he even checked under the sink, imagining the killer tucked up in there like a hermit crab, waiting to strike. All that lurked beneath the sink, though, were a pile of sponges, a roll of paper towels, bottles of various cleaners, and an empty cigar box Grandma insisted belonged there. He roamed the top floor, executed quick, single push-ups to look under the beds, riffled through the closets, then went down to the basement, poking behind the furnace and the water heater. Cobwebs, dust, desiccated spider shells, and a single pile of petrified mouse droppings that made him add by mouse traps to his mental to-do list. He even crawled into what Grandma called the rut cellar, an old crawl space under the stairs that had once served as home to an archive of Billy's childhood and early adult years. Notebooks, yearbooks, boxes of newspaper clippings, a lone swimming trophy. I figured why not, Billy had said with a shrug, and more. All of it confiscated during the trial. Jazz could have had it back just by signing some papers, but he didn't want it, and unlike the Jeep, he didn't need it. Shimming out of the crawl space, he allowed himself a small laugh at his own expense. There, can you go to bed now, you coward? He traipsed back upstairs, checked on Grandma one last time. She was really out. Made sense just to leave her on the sofa. She'd be a bit disoriented in the morning, but he'd rather deal with her disoriented in the morning than in the middle of the night. So upstairs he went, flicked on the first light of the evening, washed up, brushed his teeth. In his bed, he groaned when he saw the clock. It was a quarter to four in the morning. He had to be up for school in less than three hours. Beyond the lack of sleep, the idea of walking those halls when everybody learned about Jenny, as the rumor spread that Jazz had been there. He knew how high school gossip worked. By the end of the day, half the school would be convinced Jazz had actually killed her, and then covered it up. His dad, you know, his dad taught him how to get away with it. His dad had taught him how to get away with it. That was the hell of it. Stripping off his clothes, Jazz put Howie's cell on the nightstand and crawled into bed, stared at the ceiling, at the rigid pattern of dark and gray, etched there by the distant moon through the window grills. Had he made the right decision by bowing out? Yes. He was convinced of it. Time to let G. William handle this. The sheriff was more than capable, and if he wanted Jazz's, Jazz's advice, well, Jazz would be happy to offer it, but only when asked. Jazz sighed, sleepy, and rolled over to face the wall, then bolted out of bed, sleepy no more. Fumbling for the light switch, his adrenaline pumping so hard and fast that he flicked the switch on, then off, then on again before he could stop himself. The wall. The wall of Billy's victims. Someone had inscribed the first four pictures with a red marker, writing one, two, three, four on them and then coloring the eyes into demonic glares. The fifth picture, Isabel Hernandez, was circled in thick red loops that wavered and skittered over one another. Written over Isabella's smiling face was this, Coming soon, courtesy of the Impressionist. Chapter 23 The cops were just wrapping up their processing of the crime scene, or, as Jazz thought of it, his house, by the time the sun came up. Upon getting Jazz's call hours earlier, G. William had wasted no time and taken no chances, personally bringing a team of techs to the house. They searched the house thoroughly, scanned for listening devices, tromped through the surrounding area, questioned the nearest neighbors, no doubt thrilled to be awakened at five in the morning to be asked about that dent house, and dropped roughly a metric ton of fingerprint dust on every conceivable surface nothing. Jazz sat in the kitchen, nursing a cup of extra strength coffee with a truly obscene amount of sugar for an added boost of energy. Grandma had awakened before the cops arrived, groggy but someone lucid, though once the police got here, she demanded it was 1957 and she was at a high school dance. 
she paraded around the house in her nightgown, coyly batting her eyes lashes at the cops, who took the whole thing with good humor. One of them even danced a quick Charleston with her. Now she was puttering around in her bedroom upstairs, no doubt changing her outfit or perhaps her entire mind. The cops were packing up their gear when G. William joined Jazz in the kitchen. About those pictures on the wall? Jazz sighed. He knew G. William had to confiscate the first five, the ones the Impressionist had written on. How long you had them up? About a year, I guess. What about that screensaver on your computer? Remember Bobby Joe Long? He was some kind of serial killer, wasn't he? What's that about? He didn't do that. It's always been there. I put it there. Jazz shrugged. He was a killer, yeah, but he let one victim go. Girl named Lisa McVeigh. He knew she would lead the cops back to him, but he let her go anyway. He couldn't help himself. It was a compulsion. I guess I just... He shrugged again. I like knowing that sometimes the impulses can go the other way. That maybe it's possible to have an impulse for good. G. William clucked his tongue in a way that made Jazz want to fly across the table and rip that tongue out. He was on edge. He had been invaded. He was in no mood for anyone, even G. William, to condescend to him. You gotta let go, Jazz. Billy is Billy. He's not you. Let it go. Does that have anything to do with that guy breaking in here? Jazz snarled. This isn't about you. Don't make it personal. Of course it's about me. Of course it's personal. He came into my house. He went into my bedroom. He left a message on my wall. This is all about me. The sheriff looked like he was going to say something. Hesitated, thought better of it. He consulted his smartphone. No prints, no fibers apparent, but we vacuumed the holy hell out of this place. It'll be a while before we can sort through that, though. Looks like he picked the lock with the usual tools. We have tool marks, but nothing exotic or interesting. And that's it. No. We have a name for him now. The Impressionist? G. William arched his back, thrusting out his belly like he was pregnant. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. You have to find him, G. William. Find him or find his next victim, I.H. I've already got people come piling a list of every hotel, motel, inn, and B&B within 20 miles of here. He's not getting a fifth victim, Jazz, I promise you. Jazz wished he could believe that. The Impressionists had been one step ahead of them all along, even once they knew his pattern. There was something he was missing, he was sure. Something the Impressionists had done or would do that would make all their preparations moot. He ought to stay home from school today and get some rest. You need some rest too, big man, Jazz said. G. William's eyes were carrying as much luggage as Howie's had in the hospital. God, Howie! That seems so long ago now but it only been a couple of hours. I'll catch some Z's in the office. I'm going to leave a patrol car out front, so... Ugh! Jazz groaned and dropped his head into his hands. No. Please don't. People already treat this house like it's... like it was built over an Indian burial ground. You park a car out there and everyone's going to think I did something. That crazy dent kid. The guy came here once. G. Williams' tone offered no room for disagreement. He could come back. I'm not letting him come and go as he pleases. Maybe this is a game to him, but not to me. Got it? Before Jazz could answer, he heard the front door open and a pair of unmistakably high heels clicking on the hardwood foyer. Who could... He shot a look at G. William, who pretended innocence when Melissa's voice sounded out. Jasper? Jasper, where are you? You called her? he demanded. Your grand's getting worse. She's always been a little. Yeah, she's always been a little. Now she's a lot. You think I belong in foster care? Really? Not my call to make. That's Melissa's. They stared at each other in silence for a moment until Melissa called out again. We're in the kitchen, G. William answered. 